There were only three mortal witnesses to Jesus Christ's suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they slept through much of it. In that garden and later on the cross, Jesus took upon himself the sins, pains, and suffering of every person who ever lived, although almost no one alive at that time knew what was happening. Eternity's most important events often pass without much worldly attention. But God the Father knew. He heard the pleading of his faithful son, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. While we were not there to witness this act of selflessness and submission, we are witnesses of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Every time we repent and receive forgiveness of our sins, every time we feel the Savior's strengthening power, we can testify of the reality of what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is Hope in Christ, a Come Follow Me podcast, and I'm your host, Ben Peterson, a member of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. John chapters 17 and 18, and Luke chapter 22. Not my will, but thine be done. In some of his final moments with his disciples, Jesus Christ introduced them to an ordinance that would replace the animal sacrifices of ancient times, including the law of Moses that they were currently living. Rather than sacrifice the firstlings of their flocks, they would now be accountable to God to sacrifice their own broken heart and contrite spirit. And instead of bringing their animal sacrifices to the altar, they would bring their own sins, offering them up and letting them go forever. As part of that ordinance, the New Testament record tells us that the disciples were given broken bread that was blessed. This is my body, the Savior said, which is given for you, This do in remembrance of me. After that, he handed them a cup, saying that it is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. The disciples were given symbols of the Savior's flesh and blood, and they were invited to take these symbols inside of themselves, providing rich imagery that could teach them a great deal about what kind of close relationship they were to have with the Savior. Later on that evening and before entering Gethsemane, Jesus Christ offered up his intercessory prayer. In the Come Follow Me resource the church provided, it says this, In his prayer in John 17, Jesus emphasized his unity with the Father. In what ways are the Father and the Son one? Note that the Savior prayed that his disciples may be one even as, or in the same way, that he and his Father are one. What does that mean for you? Think about your relationships, for example, with your spouse or other family members, with ward members, with fellow Christians. How can you work toward the kind of unity that Jesus has with the Father? Because men and women are imperfect and we're mortal, the only way to achieve complete and total unity with anything in this world is to find that unity in something that is perfect and fixed, something that never changes. That unity can only come through Christ. As we become more united with Him, we can become more united with each other. And so the only way for any of us to truly become one is to become one in Christ. And in doing so, we also become one in God the Father. This is life eternal, Jesus said that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. In his book called The Promise of Discipleship, Elder Neil A. Maxwell said this about what it means to know Jesus. To know Jesus more and more is to experience his attributes. We thus draw closer by the way of appreciation, admiration, and even adoration of him we truly accelerate knowing Him as we become more like Him by means of our imperfect adulation. Close quote. In April 2013, Elder Uchtdorf added these words, To that end, God sent His Son to this earth to illuminate the way and show us how to safely cross the stumbling blocks placed in our path. 
He has given us the gospel, which teaches the way of the disciple. It teaches us the things we must know, do, and be to walk in His light, following the footsteps of His beloved Son, our Savior. Close quote. And so we come to know Christ and the Father by becoming more like them, by becoming one with them. And the only way for us as fallen mortal man to become like Christ is through the enabling power or grace of His atonement. Not just being redeemed from a fall and from sin, but becoming truly at one with God, becoming as He is, becoming sanctified, completely changed from who we used to be. You'll notice throughout John chapter 17 that the Savior focuses on that sanctifying process, pleading with the Father that He will sanctify us through truth, that they all may be one as Thou, Father, art in me and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me, and the glory which Thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I love this cross-reference in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. This is John the Beloved after a lifetime of trying to seek after that sanctifying power that Christ prayed would come over him. He said, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. In verse 23 of John 17, the Savior continued speaking of us becoming one by saying, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. The word perfect there has a dual translation. Another meaning for that word is a term that also meant to consecrate or even initiate, a process we do today through the temple ordinances. Those verses might be some that you pause on for just a few minutes and listen to what the Lord teaches you. The Savior then continued, expressing his deep love for us. Listen to how he pleads with the Father on our behalf. In verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them my name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. I don't think any of us could ever truly understand in this life the depth of the love that Jesus Christ feels for us, and the depth of love that he feels for his Father. So how can we fulfill the Savior's will that we can actually be where He is? If Jesus Christ has received eternal life, then in order to receive eternal life, we must follow His direction, and that is we must come to know Him and His Father. Elder D. Todd Christofferson said these words in April 2010, In the end, the central purpose of all Scripture is to fill our souls with faith in God the Father and in His Son Jesus Christ, faith that they exist, faith in the Father's plan for our immortality and eternal life, faith in the atonement and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which animates this plan of happiness, faith to make the gospel of Jesus Christ our way of life, and faith to come to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom He has sent. Close quote. One of the major reasons that young people tend to fall away or walk away from the church is because they have different priorities from those that Jesus Christ has taught us. In order to avoid becoming one of those who is deceived by false priorities, priorities that carry no power after death, 
we must come to place Jesus Christ at the very center of our lives, as President Nelson has taught us. As we seek to come to know Jesus Christ, to truly know Him and the Father, Elder Bednar taught us this in 2007. The Savior also taught the people to come unto Him through sacred covenants, and He reminded them that they were the children of the covenant. And President Nelson, by the way, has recently reminded us of that same truth. When he spoke to young adults last year, he spoke of them of their eternal identity as children of God, children of the covenant, and disciples of Jesus Christ. Now back to Elder Bednar's words. The Savior emphasized the eternal importance of the ordinances of baptism and of receiving the Holy Ghost. In a similar manner, you and I are admonished to turn toward and learn from Christ and to come unto Him through the covenants and ordinances of His restored gospel. As we do so, we will eventually and ultimately come to know Him in His own time and in His own way and according to His own will, as did the people in the land of Bountiful. And in October 2002, Elder D. Todd Christofferson powerfully taught Surely we cannot become one with God and Jesus Christ until we make their will and interest our greatest desire. Following the Savior's intercessory prayer, he entered into a place called Gethsemane, which in Aramaic meant olive press. As he journeyed to that place, his burden grew immensely. Elder Neil A. Maxwell has said, When the unimaginable burden began to weigh upon Christ, it confirmed his long-held and intellectually clear understanding as to what he must now do. His working through began, and Jesus declared, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Then whether in spiritual soliloquy or by way of instruction to those about him, he observed, But for this cause came I unto this hour. Later in Gethsemane, the suffering Jesus began to be sore amazed, or in the Greek, awestruck and astonished. Imagine Jehovah, the creator of this and other worlds, astonished. Jesus knew cognitively what he must do, but not experientially. He had never personally known the exquisite and exacting process of an atonement before. Thus, when the agony came in its fullness, it was so much, much worse than even he with his unique intellect had ever imagined. No wonder an angel appeared to strengthen him. The cumulative weight of all mortal sins, past, present, and future, pressed upon that perfect, sinless, and sensitive soul. All our infirmities and sicknesses were somehow too a part of the awful arithmetic of the atonement. The anguished Jesus not only pled with the Father that the hour and cup might pass from him, but with this relevant citation, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. But in the Savior's case, the cup did not pass. Elder David A. Bednar has added, Thus the Savior has suffered not just for our sins and iniquities, but also for our physical pains and anguish, our weaknesses and shortcomings, our fears and frustrations, our disappointments and discouragement, our regrets and remorse, our despair and desperation, the injustices and inequities we experience, and the emotional distresses that beset us. There is no physical pain, no spiritual wound, no anguish of soul or heartache, no infirmity or weakness you or I ever confront in mortality that the Savior did not experience first. In a moment of weakness, we may cry out, no one knows what it is like, no one understands. But the Son of God perfectly knows and understands, for He has felt and borne our individual burdens. And because of His infinite and eternal sacrifice, He has perfect empathy and can extend to us His arm of mercy. He can reach out, touch, succor, heal, and strengthen us to be more than we could ever be and help us to do that which we could never do relying upon our own power. 
Indeed, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Close quote. The spiritual and physical feelings and full effects brought about by taking upon or inside himself all of the sins and violent acts ever committed were placed upon the Savior as he lay prostrate in Gethsemane and suffered on behalf of those who would repent and allow him to be the proxy or substitute for their sins. The Apostle Paul taught that God hath made Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. In other words, in Gethsemane, Jesus became us. Our sins were transferred to him as he drank the dregs of that bitter cup. In some way that is incomprehensible to us, he took all of those sins inside himself. They would now be recorded in the fibers of his physical body rather than our own. He received in our place all of our pain and punishment. He acted in our place to take all the consequences and pains of our wicked and sinful behavior, the pain and consequences we deserve, so that we could be free from the crushing effects of our own sins. And as a result of that suffering, the Savior was covered in blood and he will descend at his second coming wearing a red robe. While as we partake in holy ordinances such as baptism, the sacrament, and the ordinances of the temple, the opposite takes place in us. We, the repentant sinners, are dressed in white, not symbolic of our purity, but rather reminding us of the purity and holiness of Jesus Christ and his ability to transfer his holiness to us in exchange for the filth of our sins. You see, as we partake in these sacred priesthood ordinances, and you'll notice this as you pay close attention to the symbolism of the ordinances, his perfection can be transferred to us. He became us in the garden, and now we can become him. He took inside himself our sins, and now we take inside and upon ourselves his very name and emblems of the one perfect being who has ever lived on this earth. We are made alive not because of our own efforts or our faith or even our repentance. We are made alive spiritually because Jesus Christ has made us alive. Do you understand the significance of what took place in Gethsemane that day? Do you understand the significance of what is taking place during the sacrament and temple ordinances? As you reflect on your own deep love and gratitude for Jesus Christ, I share with you these words from Elder D. Todd Christofferson. Let us consider the cost of God's precious love. Jesus revealed that to atone for our sins and redeem us from death, both physical and spiritual, his suffering caused himself, even God the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, and to bleed at every pore, and to suffer both body and spirit, and would that he might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. His agony in Gethsemane and on the cross was greater than any mortal could bear. Nevertheless, because of his love for Father and for us, he endured, and as a consequence he can offer us both immortality and eternal life. It is poignantly symbolic that blood came from every pore as Jesus suffered in Gethsemane, the place of the olive press. To produce olive oil in the Savior's time, olives were first crushed by rolling a large stone over them. The resulting mash was placed in soft, loosely woven baskets, which were piled one upon another. Their weight expressed the first and finest oil. Then added stress was applied by placing a large beam or log on top of the sacked baskets, producing more oil. Finally, to draw out the very last drops, the beam was weighted with stones on one end to create the maximum crushing pressure. And yes, the oil is blood red as it first flows out. Elder Christofferson continued, I think of Matthew's account of the Savior as he entered Gethsemane that fateful night that he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, 
not as I will, but as thou wilt. Then, as I imagine the distress grew even more severe, he pleaded a second time for relief and finally, perhaps at the peak of his suffering, a third time. He endured the agony until justice was satisfied to the very last drop. This he did to redeem you and me. What a precious gift is divine love! Filled with that love, Jesus asks, Will ye not now return unto me, and repent of your sins, and be converted, that I may heal you? Tenderly he reassures us, Behold, mine arm of mercy is extended towards you, and whosoever will come, will I receive, and blessed are those who come unto me. Will you not love him who first loved you? Then keep his commandments. Will you not be a friend to him who laid down his life for his friends? Then keep his commandments. Will you not abide in his love and receive all that he graciously offers you? Then keep his commandments. I pray that we will feel and fully abide in his love. Close quote. As we think about the Savior's suffering in Gethsemane, and as we study it this week, what is perhaps most remarkable to me is to hear the Savior ask, essentially, is there any other way to do this? If there is any other way, any other way, let this cup pass from me. Don't make me go through with this. But even after asking such a question and requesting such a favor, Jesus Christ, our perfect Savior and Redeemer, ultimately did exactly what his Father asked him to do. Because there was no other way. In complete humility and obedience, Jesus said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And as President Nelson has taught us and reminded us, he suffered his Father's will, seeing the joy that was set before him, knowing exactly what it would do for you and I, knowing that his prayer would be answered to bring us to where he is if he would follow through with this sacred mission. Jesus Christ willingly suffered for us. That is why we keep the commandments. We don't keep God's commandments simply because if we do, we'll be blessed. Instead, we obey God's commandments out of pure love for Him and love for what He gave up when He offered up His Son and love for our Savior, knowing that He willingly suffered unspeakable and incomprehensible suffering and pain on our behalf. Thank you for listening to this scripture highlight. As you study these chapters this week, dive in deep, ask lots of questions, Look at things from a different perspective than you have in the past. Listen closely to the Savior's words. Think about every single one of those words. And remember that everything He did, He did for you. This is a message of hope in Christ.